Hello, hello, this is Alicia Young, and welcome to Teach Me Freedom. This podcast is about learning how to live a freer life from authors, entrepreneurs, and experts, those who have done it and who teach others how to do it as well, and what it feels like while applying those methods to our lives along the way. Every episode will deliver resources, anecdotes, and or reviews to support you in living a more freedom-filled life. Let's jump in. Freedom Finders, today's episode is you and me and the book The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas J. Stanley and William D. Danko. In this episode, along with other review episodes, I'll give you some background on the book itself, along with why I chose to read it. I'll also discuss some key ideas and things I enjoyed about the book, along with any critiques I have, and the takeaways, along with what's next, where do we go from reading this, what actions are to be considered, and what does that also mean for future podcast episodes. So I did get this book years ago, I think maybe in 2016. Um, and the reason I read it is because I wanted to understand what millionaires do. I think, as you know, with this podcast, a big focus of it is learning from other people what they're doing so we can know how do we apply it if we'd like to achieve similar things or at least go along a similar trajectory. So this book is the culmination of a comprehensive study which looked at what the definition of wealth is and how do millionaires and wealthy individuals become wealthy. The interviews were done with more than 500 millionaires and more than 11,000 high net worth and high income men responded to the surveys. The time frame that this was taken was from May 1995 through to January 1996, and the book was published in 1996. And there are 249 questions which focused on the behaviors and attitudes regarding wealth. And some of the key areas included budgeting, planning, bargaining when it comes to making certain purchases. And an interesting topic that I learned about through this book called economic outpatient care, which can also be stated as gifts or acts of kindness that high income earners or millionaires may give to their children or future generations. Another interesting aspect of this book is that it looks at how people become wealthy in one generation. The majority of the people who participated in this survey and in the interviews became wealthy in one generation. And it was also trying to figure out why is it that there are people who earn very high incomes but they don't have a lot of wealth. They also interviewed their advisors, so individuals who work with wealthy people such as CPAs, accountants, lawyers, and looking at their actions and they're able to, to give some input because of the conversations they're having. Let's dive into the key ideas. Key idea number one, differentiating between wealth versus having a high income. A key distinction that is made in this book is the difference between wealth and having a high income. And they say that wealth is not the same as income. Wealth is based on what you accumulate and what you what you save. And so just because somebody has a high income and seems to be making a lot of money per hour and are really busy, it doesn't equate to wealth. And those who are most wealthy live below their means. It was mentioned that those who are financially independent can maintain their current lifestyle for years without needing to work for 10 plus years. And when reading that, it reminded me of a program that I looked into when I was first getting into personal finance. And we may discuss this book and in a future episode, but it's Dave Ramsey. If you're interested in personal finance, it's very likely that you have heard of Dave Ramsey. I'm a big fan of his work and his principles and his baby steps. And I took a video course and in the course there was a, a female and I believe we're around the same age, which is probably why it really resonated with me. And she talked about when working in different jobs or in her career, um, she had this level of stress because of the fact of needing to earn a paycheck. And she said like once she got to a point where she paid off her debt, she saved her emergency fund and was working the steps that she felt that she could speak up more. She didn't have that hesitation, which stemmed from the fear of 
potential consequences such as being let go, uh, being fired and needing to find work, especially when you're relying on that because you need that for future coming bills. So that made me wonder about what must be going on in somebody who is financially independent in their mind and and in their spirit to know that I can I can continue to work. I work because I like it or work because I have more financial goals that I'm working towards. But to know that if anything were to happen, whether it be another crisis, for example, knowing that they can maintain their lifestyle for many years to come over a decade. I wonder how empowering that must feel. The thing about this financial independence is that I thought that I'd read like one of my one of the conception one of the things I thought I'd read about is about people winning the lottery or gaining inheritances or being very famous or entering like some line of work where it's very risky so because of that level of risk you're getting a high payout but it stated that a lot of them like they they worked slowly steadily <laughs> lottery lottery winnings weren't mentioned and although uh, some may have gained an inheritance there is a calculation we'll discuss where that inheritance is factored in into the calculation which discusses what one's net worth quote unquote should be something else that was discussed was the society that we live in being in a consumption-based society partly by the glamorization we have from advertising people want to go into our pockets take our money before we get to it hollywood lifestyle being thrown in our faces so we're very well depending on where you live and and where the influence is coming from there's that connection between wealth and hyper consumption so it was interesting to read that most people who are wealthy live below their means and i understood this to an extent but i didn't i didn't realize uh, what that number may be and also didn't understand how their finances work so how do what do they actually live off live off of and how much do they put away so this book was helpful in explaining that some more. Next is key point number two, which is the concept of economic outpatient care, the gift that stunts financial potential. Reading this book was the first time I heard this term and it's economic outpatient care are substantial economic gifts and acts of kindness that some parents will give their future generations, whether it be their, their adult children or their, um, their children's children. And it's meant to help. It's meant to be supportive. And that can also play into fears of are the children going to get too used to this? Are they going to be able to sustain this? But what stood out to me was that it's connected to a lack of productivity amongst the ad amongst the adult children because it affects their psychology. And it makes sense if you're going to be receiving finances and funds and you kind of come to whether it's consciously or subconsciously expect it, then a lot of people may reduce their effort. They may think, well, this is going to help me more than I can help myself. So why am I going to work so hard or go off, go after certain opportunities? And so the authors mentioned that these gifts will dampen the children's initiative and their productivity. And essentially they become underachievers in generating income. This made me see earning power as a very malleable thing and I never I never really looked at it as somebody being an over, underachiever in generating income because I never saw anybody as being an overachiever in generating income. But that shifted my perspective on I guess the game of making money or at least start to see it as a game where we can make changes to increase our ability to generate income. Now, speaking of generating income, let's jump to point number three, which is the 15% rule. You may have seen this number in other personal finance or just heard it thrown around when it comes to how much we want to aim minimum to be paying ourselves. A key, tr a key trend is that most millionaires save at least 15% of their earned income. This took me on a detour because I wanted to learn the difference between realized income versus unrealized income. And so in the show notes, you'll find two links that I found to be very helpful. When it comes to understanding unrealized income, the link I used is from Investopedia. And they said, realized income is income that's earned and received. For example, this can be wages or a salary, income from different investments or dividends that are paid out and claimed as a result of them being realized, so being claimed. Whereas 
for understanding unrealized income, I reference the resource savespendsplurge.com and they have a great example. They break it down into what it will look like with actual numbers. And so my understanding of the definition is that unrealized income is money that you earn, but you haven't actually claimed as yet. So if you purchased some form of an investment and the value of it has gone up, but you haven't sold it to obtain the actual profit yet. So an example of this can be a home. Um, so you purchased a home and then you saw that it increased in value, but you haven't sold it yet. That's a lot of potential right there. So now that we've looked at the, def the difference between realized income versus unrealized income, let's go back to the, the key point number three, which is that they save at least 15% of their earned, so their annual realized income before putting anything anywhere else. So this is this is the money that they, they get pre-tax. So they're basing it on, for example, if you work a salary job and say it's $40,000 a year, then they're setting aside 15% of that number. Um, so they're not setting aside the 15% the of the net amount. Another point that was connected to saving at least 15% of their earned income is that they're adamant about investing. And so the number given on average was investing nearly 20% of their household realized income every year. Another stat was that 79% of them have at least one account with a brokerage company, but they make their own investment decisions, which is very empowering to hear because I have received stats where having a financial planner um, can really help your income to grow, mainly, mainly because they will help to keep you accountable when the market takes its inevitable dip uh, because that's often when a lot of people panic and want to take their money out. Um, but of course, there can be fees involved and they might not be visible fees, but the fees can be taken taken away from what you're actually investing in. And some places, some I guess some brokerages or some organizations charge higher fees. So it was encouraging to see that they, they have that level of confidence and the desire, very goal oriented to want to become better investors. And they ensure that they're spending that time to do that, but also investing in the services of accountants and CPA. So financial professionals. So my brain was thinking, do you actually need the services of a financial professional or can you do it yourself? So it's interesting to see they do both. Key point number four is career goals. High education does not equate to wealth. I'll be honest with you, this is a tough point for me because and this is partly why I really wanted to read the book is because I wanted to see what's the connection between higher education and level of wealth. And I wanted some consolation for the fact that I'm not wealthy and also to learn, to learn about what to do now and what may have been helpful then. And it's just part of that whole process of moving forward. So it was nice to see that there was a blend of individuals who pursued higher education, such as advanced degrees, like law degrees, medical degrees, PhDs, but there were also men who didn't pursue college. They decide to go into the workforce earlier and instead of spending that time in school where they're out of the workforce for the most part, and then some people went to college or some people went to post-secondary but then didn't complete it. A point that came out from this is that people who spend a long time in school, there are expectations both from the people going to school but also the people around them who are like, hey, you're, you're taking this valuable time and you're going to school. There's this expectation to be high consumers in a, in a way to play the part. But another component of that is also postponing employment. A key idea floating around my head when I was reading this is this is why I went to school. I thought that I could rely on my love for academic love for academics and learning and flip that into the ability to earn lots of money and not have to worry about the future. <laughs> it, was, it was very naive, very naive. Um, but I really thought that going to school and spending all this time in school, getting these higher degrees would automatically yield higher income. And then I realized after after taking business courses, after completing the program, that just because you, as they say, hang a shingle up on the wall doesn't mean that people are just going to come to you for your services. There's like a whole new level of learning involved with starting, starting and setting up a business, but also keeping your education up to date, continuing education. And I know I'm going on a teeny bit of a tangent here, 
but it's to say this is and this has a lot of this reading this book has led to a lot of reflection and so it it helped me to see why I made a decision to go into a different career and so that's something else that we'll be discussing in a future season. Another aspect of looking at career is the stats said that two thirds, thirds of the millionaire men work between 45 and 55 hours per week. This was interesting to me because my brain was thinking that it could go one of two ways. I was expecting to either read about workaholics who work like 70 plus hours per week. 45 and 55, I still think those can be kind of high depending on what field of work they're in and, and what the requirements are um but also but i also was thinking about the flip side of the four hour work week so i'm imagining that these millionaires they're just chilling they're laying back they have millions of dollars they don't really need to work because they're living off of a small percentage of their millions and a lot of them can live that lifestyle but they but they choose not to and so i was interested to hear about what their recommendations would be for what careers to pursue and the authors made sure to emphasize like although there are different industries that are more profitable in nature or have the potential to be uh, more profitable there's no guarantee that just going in 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 an industry is going to generate profits there's other aspects <laughs> involved but it was interesting to hear the input from the millionaires they suggest future generations consider providing affluent people with some type of valuable service when it connects to managing their finances so they talked about financial advisors accountants their attorneys um and so they highly suggest accounting and law along with tax advising and estate planning they foresee these are going to be services that increase in demand now for our final key point which is paw versus aaw versus uaw and what do all these letters stand for you ask paw stands for prodigious accumulators of wealth they rank in the top quartile for wealth accumulation AAW stands for Average Accumulators of Wealth and UAW stands for Under Accumulators of Wealth and so they are in the bottom quartile of wealth accumulation. To see, thing, to see it broken down this way was interesting because then the authors further differentiated between the ways that PAWs, so PAWs and UAWs, UAWs live their lives, the decisions that they make, uh, their mindsets, and their attitudes. Of note, paws have strong financial offense and defense, but they also spend about eight hours per month of planning, like planning out their finances, their investment, their financial plan. That makes it seem very doable for becoming a millionaire. It takes preparation and it takes being frugal, but it, see, it doesn't seem like something so far off, especially because most of these millionaires were able to achieve this in one generation. Just to clarify, strong offense is referring to generating higher than the normal median income. And I believe that was around 30,000 or 33,000 annually based on when this book was published back in 1996. So hopefully it's higher now just to keep up with inflation. And then strong defense is connected to being frugal when it comes to spending on on consumer goods and services and really their focus is on investing in assets that are going to appreciate in value so not things that you just purchase and then they decline in value like fancy cars things that are high quality things that are going to further develop and grow when it comes to you Oz this isn't too surprising but sometimes we need to hear it <laughs> and we need to hear which category we're in for it to really sink in, especially if having strong finances is something of importance to us. And so UAs live above their means and emphasize consumption while really putting less emphasis on factors that are crucial for wealth building, especially when it comes to doing this over the long term. A quote from the book is that UAs are possessed by possession. He works for things. His motivation and his thoughts are focused on the symbols of economic success. He constantly needs to convince others of this success. Unhappily, he has never convinced himself. In essence, he works, he earns, and he sacrifices to impress others. And really, again, I know I mentioned Dave Ramsey earlier in this episode, but this line reminded me of what Dave Ramsey commonly says, work 
working hard to impress people that you don't even like. And this is what it sounds like. And that idea of keeping up with the Joneses, like at the end of the day, why is it so important? And this is why a lot of paws live in neighborhoods where it's common for people to not have such a high level of status, make a certain amount of money. You're playing, you have to play the part. There's that expectation as we talked about before. You make a lot of money, well, you need to be impressive. It's like stuff that we'll talk about in the career season is, oh, yeah, well, if you want to get a certain job, you have to look the part. Fake it till you make it. But another thing that was mentioned in the book is Yuwas who will move into these neighborhoods which have paws in them and the values of the homes are incredibly high. And so the Yuwas go purchasing the property with the idea of, you know, I'm going to achieve the status through purchasing this house. So I'm going to achieve status over time, not knowing that the paws, they did their time, they saved up, it's already covered, their mortgages are taken care of, or they moved in way before. And so the value has climbed while they were there. So that's paws, UAs, and AAWs. Now let's go into the critiques and then I'll wrap up with some of the key takeaways. So honestly, I'm, I'm still putting together a lot of pieces from things that I'm reading. So I'm not going to have much to criticize. I mean, I, lo I love how the book has a lot of statistics and I really enjoyed the way that it's so detailed and thorough. I definitely want to be informed when the publisher comes up with an updated version of the study. And also I would love to see the stats for Canada because this was based on America. So with that being said, my main critique is that the focus was so much on males as the generators of the high income. I would have loved to see a book where I could see myself in it because even though it, it's data and it's actions, it tells us what we need to do, I still feel like at a distance from the content because I'm a woman. There's other factors at play when it comes to making money. For example, the gender wage gap, which we'll discuss when we have a season that focuses on career. And then other factors, for example, being a person of color, so being a black female, then sometimes there's discrimination, not to say I I've encountered it, but I know that people encounter it. Nuances that I did enjoy in this book was they did look at different cultures and looked at common spending habits of, of course, based on who replied to the survey, common spending habits of people who move from different countries to the states. And they find that it's typical to be influenced into the culture of high consumption. So now let's wrap up with takeaways from the book and then we'll finish it off with what's next for what we're going to be reading about next. Takeaway number one was that idea of buy and hold. It's something that millionaires do when it comes to homes. A lot of the people who interviewed and responded, they've lived in their homes for over 20 years and so they've seen the value of their home grow. And so that's a form of unrealized income because they haven't sold their homes yet. And then that idea of buying and holding in investments. I'm curious to hear about your thoughts on investing. So I remember when I was doing some courses related to financial advising, I thought that when I was going for training that I would be learning about active trading. That's what I thought investing was. And then I learned that no, the focus is to buy and hold for as long as you can. And so there's no need to be actively trading because there are a lot of fees associated with that. And when it comes to investing, the millionaires are about the long term gain. And so they do the research on the different products that they're investing in so that they'll want to be investing in something that has promise. And it's just natural for different products to go up and down. So this is why we diversify. But it was very nice to read that that's the strategy that they typically take. And there might be like a few investments here and there that they may let go of earlier because of performance. Um, but overall, the, the plan, the investment plan, the financial plan is to buy and hold. And that's consistent with what I've learned about achieving financial prosperity. Another takeaway is a calculation that the authors provide to understand what your net worth quote unquote should be. But it was very encouraging to have a specific number to know, well, this is a good benchmark to aim for. Another takeaway is that to build wealth, minimize realized taxable income and maximize your unrealized incomes. Another way that they differentiate unrealized versus realized income is that unrealized income is capital appreciation 
without a cash flow. But I found I, I like that definition from save, spend, splurge. That helped me to understand it a lot better. But we each have our different ways of learning. And tied to that, just because of job insecurity and just things that may happen with different companies and just a direction that they take and not being able to completely 100% know one's future when working as an employee, um, they say that even high income producing employees are not likely to be millionaires. Part of that can stem from the fact that they may be having a high consumption lifestyle, but also there may be that, oh, it's things are fine now. I'll worry about it if, if it even does happen and when I get to it. It's, it's different when somebody's self-employed and, and they're completely relying on their own income versus working in that employee mindset. And I encourage you to learn more about that. Uh, check out the interview with Katrina where we talked about her book, Steal Your Skills from Corporate, because she also talks about that in more depth. Something else tied to that that stuck with me is the statement that you will never become financially independent without purchasing investments that appreciate without income realization. So it really talks to that idea of efficiency. Like if financial independence and growing your finances is important, then these are the things that need to be done. And so it's not just about what you can earn in that moment. It's putting it aside so that it can continue to grow. And so that's where that compound interest factors in. And that's where the fact that you're not being taxed on it in that time frame, that's where that becomes important. So hoping to talk about that in more depth in a future episode. And the last takeaway is an analogy that I really liked because it clicked and I'm not sure if you're like me or if you can relate but it talks about comparing you you was to the process of weight loss depending on the strategy used and so it says you was are like overweight people who might starve themselves to reach their ideal weight but then end up gaining what they lost and more and so they set that really big goals but get discouraged and disenchanted and then don't stay the course to sum it up they think that other can lose weight for them. So this isn't to be talking about weight and that side of things, but it's the analogy of that intensity. So you was tend to be focused on, I want results right away, right now. And I can relate to that because three times in my life, I achieved substantial amount of weight loss. The first time was done very healthy and I maintained it for a longer period of time than the second two times. The second two times I was just fed by the compliments I was getting and the intensity of the practices I was using. I convinced myself it was healthy, but it wasn't healthy for me. But I say that to, to say like, it's this attitude of like, I'm going to go hard. I'm going to, I'm not going to be realistic about my approach. I'm going to go hard and it's not going to be sustainable. And then if something is not sustainable, then how are you going to reap the benefits when this is supposed to be a long-term thing? So that was a really major takeaway. So now let's discuss what's next based on reading this book. I'd like to discuss a book which focuses on women who are high income generators. And the author also released another book in the series which focuses on just that so I'll definitely be including that. Some other topics that stem from what we've discussed in this book will be looking into frugalism so let's talk about that some more and also the fire movement so financial independence, retire early. We'll be talking about that. Spending addiction. So this more ties into the high consumption lifestyle. And why do we feel the need to consume? I mean, there's different types of spending styles that are in, we, we're on a spectrum from spender versus very frugal. So it's like what compels us to be one way versus the other and how do we get to a healthy balance and be able to achieve our goals? And then mention it a few times, but also planning to do a separate season where it's going to be focused on career and it's going to talk about some of what we talked about here for example the wage gap and then how does working as an employee affect your future finances or what do we need to put in place to ensure the most success is possible for our future for retirement that kind of thing and i'd also like to have an interview with my financial planner about things such as insurance, but also just financial wellness overall. So again, please feel free to send me an email to teachmefreedom2020 at gmail.com if you have any questions, any ideas for future episodes, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode itself, your thoughts and your feedback. Um, otherwise, I hope that you read the book and I hope that it helps you to think about and be able to achieve your goals. See you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Teach Me Freedom podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and found it beneficial. 
feel free to reach out to us at teachmefreedom2020 at gmail.com. And if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to the show on your favorite platform for streaming content. Feel free to comment and leave a four or five star review if you feel so inclined. Connect with you next time.